Hello, and welcome to Play On with Austin Playhouse. This week, we are celebrating the publication of award-winning playwright Lisa B. Thompson's collection of plays. Austin Playhouse first encountered Lisa's play, Monroe, when she submitted it for the 2018 Austin Playhouse Festival of New American Plays. Monroe went on to win the festival, and Austin Playhouse produced the world premiere in September of 2018. Monroe and two more of Lisa's plays that received world premieres in Austin, Underground and The Mammalogs, are featured in a new play collection published by Northwestern University Press. For this week's podcast, co-producing artistic director of Austin Playhouse, Laura Toner Haddock, welcomes Lisa B. Thompson and several artistic collaborators who have acted in, directed, and produced Lisa's work. Big thanks to Mark Puhay, Taji Sr., Christine Huang, Deja Morgan, Marcus McCorder, Rudy Ramirez, and Valenicia Tolbert for joining us to discuss what makes Lisa's work so wonderful and so necessary. Good afternoon, and thank you all for being here. This is Laura Toner Haddock. I'm the Producing Artistic Director of Austin Playhouse, and it is my great privilege to have a wonderful group of artists with us today to talk about a new play collection that's being published of uh, three works by Lisa B. Thompson. These plays all had their world premieres in Austin, Texas, and we have some of the writers, directors, and producers of these plays with us today. And so I'm going to let them all introduce themselves and then we'll we'll hear a little from Lisa herself. Thanks. Hello, uh, my name is Valenicia Tolbert and I was privileged uh, to do the opening premiere of The Momologues as Beverly. Um, also in another one of her plays, not in this one, a uh, single black female, SBD, uh, SB2. Uh, it's it's always an honor and a privilege because it's pieces that are founded in joy. Uh, we we have a lot of pieces that are always about you know the oppression and the the angst of being a person of color, but these are all pieces that every experience that I've had, like both shows, were just filled with laughter and joy, along with talking about something serious. There was just that realness of of life. You know, you don't always like murk yourself in in dire situations like even in in the the worst of situations there's light so um that was my experience love it i love you hi i'm deja um i was blessed to be a part of uh, monroe and i originated the role of cherry um my first time actually like working with like pretty much an all-black cast in like a show which have been like a rare experience for me. So I was like really grateful to be in that space with other like wonderful black artists and also like just being able to like perform like Lisa's words where it's like she just gave us everything we needed. And um, Lisa B. Thompson shows like focus on like an actual like black experience. I mean like versus like a black experience through like a white lens, obviously, because she's a black woman. And that was like really refreshing um, because it wasn't just about like the challenges and the triumphs and like are the challenges and like all the struggles that we have to like overcome because I feel like that's something that is like a stereotype in like a black genre of theater. And it was really nice to focus on like our lives like that are robust and like have these many different facets. And I think that Lisa B. Thompson like really, especially in Monroe, like just showed all sides of like the black life versus just like one thing that's supposed to be like what black theater is about. And it was just like a really refreshing experience for me. And um, so, yeah, it, it was a huge joy and privilege and honor to be able to perform Lisa's words and um, yeah. Thank you so much. I love you. Thanks, Deja. Hi, my name is Mark Puhay. Uh, I've been lucky enough to, uh, and I say lucky, blessed to be in two of Lisa's world premieres, uh, both Underground, uh, directed by Rudy, uh, probably below me. I can't, I don't know where you see him on his Brady Bunch chart. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
uh, and then also in uh, in Monroe with uh, Deja and as the lead, she she did a fantastic job. Um, yes, there's definitely there were definitely humor in both of those plays, but I I, I really find that the intelligence of the of the scripts of the pieces and the relationships that Lisa designs the worlds that she creates because she creates entire full fully realized worlds uh, is very fulfilling to me um, I do mostly uh, dramatic pieces uh, but the humor in both of the pieces was was very refreshing uh, the, the the lens of the black experience through black eyes and exploring blackness and exploring the difficult parts of our experience as well in, in the two plays in Underground and Monroe was very refreshing and very important. And I feel that, I particularly feel that Underground is probably the most important play that I've, I've been a part of in the last five years. Easy, easy. So thank you, Lisa. Um, Christine? Hi, I'm Christine Huang. Uh, and this time last year, I had the privilege of producing the world premiere of Lisa B. Thompson's The Mamalogs. And it was directed by Rudy Ramirez, who my eyes are going down because he's here in my Brady Bunch Square. And it also starred Valenicia, who's up here. I'm looking at you, Val. And, um, and I'm looking at Lisa as well. It was a really fantastic experience. I think it brought joy and tears and heartbreak and then joy again to every audience member who got the chance to see the, the show. So that was last year, but the very first time I got introduced to Lisa's work was through Marcus McWhorter. I saw a short play of hers called Mother's Day, and I was blown away. I think Rudy may have also been in the audience there. It was at Hyde Park Theater. Mm -hmm. And then I looked at the program, and I was like, who is Marcus McWhorter? Who is Lisa B. Thompson? And I Googled like a stalker, <laughs> and I emailed Marcus. I was like, let's go to lunch and talk because I'm just blowing up with ideas. Got to meet Lisa, saw the world premiere of Underground with Mark uh, Puhe and Jeffrey Johnson, Jeffrey Dashay Johnson, and then got a chance to go to some readings for the Mama Logs. And then we we're like, let's make it happen, Lisa. I'm producing your play. She said, let's go. Met up with Rudy for breakfast tacos and we made it happen uh, with Valenicia, Melody, Holy Love, and um, Yvonne Oaks. Uh, and then I got a chance to see Single Black Female with Valenicia and Michelle Alexander and really looking, and then also Monroe with Taji, with Deja, directed by Laura. So this is, feels like a, a, a huge family in the room. And as a producer, I just want to say this collection of plays, if you produce a Lisa B. Thompson play, not only do you get her marvelous words, her joy, her humor, uh, the trust that she instills in the audience member to take you through a journey that will break your heart, but then also restore you in act two, so you can go into the world and, and, um, and live it fully. You also get a marketing machine in Lisa. So she will help you sell tickets like nobody's business. That's just my, my producer pitch. <laughs> I agree. I, I, will, I will producer concur on that. <laughs> um, Taji, are you? Hi, um, I'm Taji Sr. And I had the distinct honor and privilege of first working with Lisa B. Thompson four years ago on um, a play that she wrote for Out of Ink Festival um, at Hyde Park Theater, <laughs> where I played the last Black woman on earth. Um, and that was directed by Rudy Ramirez. And that experience really changed my life in a myriad of ways. And then I had the honor and privilege to understudy for Crystal Bird Caviel for the world premiere of Monroe in 2018. And for me as an actor, my favorite thing about working on Elisa B. Thompson production is that it's so easy like the characters are so vivid and so rich and so complex and yet like you know you know who they are the first sentence in 
you know who that is. You know who that, you know who Cherry is. You know who Cousin Viola is. You know who all of these people are and yet they belong to themselves still. And like her sort of uncanny ability to write archetypes in a way that are fully realized is remarkable to me um, in something as a writer that I'm constantly striving for and like that I keep in the back of my mind like how do I make this character recognizable but also give them an intense personal um, very realized emotional interior and I think that that is what is so fun and so challenging and so great about working on a Lisa B. Thompson production because as an actor she has she's written with so much intentionality that you know what your job is but there's still room for you to do some of that fine coloring in yourself and then on a personal note i just like name drop lisa like nobody's business <laughs> Ears should be on fire all the time because I like am just out in the world being like so my mentor Dr. Lisa B. Thompson like if she is not resting on her laurels no worries I definitely am um because I am so proud to know her and I feel so privileged to be in her company and to be someone who has her phone number so don't question me. I know legit people in the world. Um, and I and I also want to say, like, I should say that I'm I'm in grad school right now, and um, being a black woman in academia on a student level, from that perspective, I don't know that we fully understand what Lisa has endured and survived and built so that we could have the scholarship around Black art to propel it into canon status in the way that it should be. Like she is adding on to a lineage of Black women writers and Black feminist scholars and thinkers who help legitimize and canonize Black work. Um, like black work is legitimate outside of the canon, but it is important for that work to be archived and canonized and for artists to get paid. And Lisa has been very quietly and diligently working towards making that happen. And um, so I'm just so grateful. Thanks, Taji. Um, Marcus? Hey, uh, that, was, that was way too intelligent. Tashi. <laughs> uh, that was good. Um, I don't know. Lisa, have we worked on anything? I just know we, we get together and talk shit all the time. So I'm not sure what we actually, actually work on. Now we uh, worked on a couple of Lisa's pieces and um, they're a lot of fun. We did a uh, single black female and uh, Mother's Day and, and a whole lot of trash talk. Um, it's, it's always fun to work on Lisa play. Um, as everybody said, it's fun, it's, it's enriching. Um, I think when you work on, and maybe Laura and Rudy, y'all can speak to this as well, uh, from a directorial perspective, uh, you, you know, you work on a show and there's, there's the language of the script and then there's the language of the craft, working with the actors. Um, but I found that it's, it's always really nice to work with, especially, well, working with living playwrights that there's this third language in the room when I'm working with Lisa. There's stuff that, that we already know, you know what I'm saying? Uh, from the experience that, um, that don't need to be said out loud, but are there and present in the script. Um, and directorially, um, yes, Taji, we know these people. I mean, you, you read one of Lisa's scripts and you forget you're reading a script. It's like, oh yeah, this is, this is fiction, is it really? Yeah. Um, it's just really good. It's really good. Um, which from as director it makes you kind of nervous because it's like, how, how am I going to screw this up? <laughs> Cause it's already there. It's already there. How am I going to screw this up? And, um, but, but it's easy to direct. It's, it's, you know, like how they say with Shakespeare, he directs from the grave. Um, it's, it's all built in, it's all baked in. And if you just get out of the way and, and do your job casting it well, get really good actors like these people here. Um, the work speaks and it speaks volumes. Um, 
and and we love it. It's always a joy to work on one of one of Lisa's plays. Absolutely, um, Rudy, welcome. Hello, I apologize for my lateness. Um, right on time. Thank you. So I uh, I first met Lisa as a PhD student at the University of Texas uh, in the Performance and Public Practice Program. And uh, she was a respondent to a, a piece by another student that I was directing. And she, uh, it was, she was so wonderful from moment one. And, um, and I, uh, as we began speaking more and more, I, first of all, I realized that she would be the best person to be my mentor in academia for all the reasons people have said. Uh, but I also said, hey, I've got a theater uh, that I work with a lot and uh, we would love to produce your work. Um, so I, my first time working with Lisa actually was on Watch with Tajdi and with Matrix uh, Kilgore as part of the uh, uh, Scriptworks Out of Ink Festival. Uh, but then uh, the biggest undertakings were uh, Underground <laughs> in 2017 and uh, the monologues last year. And um, my, the thing that I say is that, uh, you know, Lisa's brain is a Lamborghini, you know, and she pulls up and, you know, she says, get in loser, we're just battling white supremacy. And, um, and, you just, and you just jump in and race down the road with her in just like, and, and you have the time of your life. And, uh, and it says, because she, she, she goes, you know, she, her, mind, her mind is so fast and works so well, and she's so funny all the time. And, um, and you know, you're, you're catching up with it, uh, but you're, you're enjoying the process as you're, you're trying to like run alongside her. Uh, in the plays that I've worked on, uh, it's interesting because I think that there's, that, that Lisa has so much philosophy, so much, uh, political and social analysis, so much history, so much of a sense of, of Black literature, of Black uh, performance history that goes into everything, you know, that, um, that her plays on the one hand are plays of ideas, but at the same time, uh, she's able to ground those ideas in particular character points of view. And um, so that uh, every perspective is very well informed and she grants her characters this knowledge while at the same time allowing these debates that have been taking place, you know, for decades, if not, you know, more than, a, more than you know, a couple of centuries to play out uh, between these characters in ways that are often so personal and so intimate and uh, so rooted in the day-to-day -day practice of living. Uh, and so it really is about the revolutionary practice as a day-to-day -day practice. And, uh, and you can't beat that. Absolutely. Thanks, Rudy. Um, and I, d I did want to go back and get in uh, a Taji credit that she missed. Um, she played the role of Cherry, which Deja later played in the world premiere, but Taji played it in the um, the Austin Playhouse uh, New Play Festival reading, which is where um, Austin Playhouse decided to produce um, Monroe as a, as a world premiere production, and your performance had a huge amount to do with that. So um, I want to make sure that's that credit is acknowledged as well. Um, Lisa, do you, would you like to, to speak to a moment about really anything or but about what this, this play collection that's come together from these works? I think Lisa's screen may be a little frozen right now, so we'll wait for her to, to, to be back with us. Um, and I will. I, I think I, I I missed mentioning that I, I directed, as has been mentioned, the world premiere of, of Monroe for Austin Playhouse. Um, and everything that that everyone has said is I I, I feel as well. The when we were reading, we re get hundreds of plays um, submitted to to the New Play Festival, and Monroe um, 
was called from the opening group and, and handed to me as a, as a possibility for a finalist. Um, and the characters just jumped off the page. It was one of the, you know, you read a lot of new plays and a lot of new plays are plays of ideas, but the dialogue doesn't ring true. And there's Lisa, it's, it's really hard for her to write poor dialogue. These characters feel like people from the get go. Um, and whatever is raw or needs to, needs to be polished in the rehearsal process, that's not the, the issue. There's, there's humor and life. Um, and you're engaged instantly in the in the lives of of these people that she's she's um, bringing to the stage. Um, Lisa, it, whenever you're you're technically there, please feel free to jump in. Um, otherwise, I'll ask uh, Mark and maybe some of some of y'all who have worked with with uh, Lisa a couple times. What does it mean for you as an actor or as a director to to how is it different from from working with me. um either a previously published piece or a playwright for the first time you know what makes working with lisa really unique i see mark and taji both nodding on this so either one of y'all i'll speak to that um especially in underground but also in, in in monroe um i was involved in one of the earlier readings and then seeing how it changed and uh, in underground specifically uh, lisa has the ability to tailor the work and view it as a living, living organism, you know, while it's still being produced. And the, the, the version that you're reading in the book is maybe a little bit different than, than the, uh, definitely different than the original reading version we had. But Lisa has the ability to generate pages of clear, concise text, like every night. It's, you know, you're learning the lines and it's a lot. It's words, words, words. <laughs> you're learning the lines. And then, you know, the director might want to tweak something, say, this might fit a little bit better here. And Lisa fully understands and, you know, is not married to her work, even though the work is, is brilliant to begin with. But as an actor, you're moving along and learning it. And you're like, how did you come up with 15 pages of text last night and teach and be a mother to a, an 11-year-old or 14-year-old boy now? Uh, and I think it's fascinating because, you know, most of the stuff that I do and and I can speak for Val and maybe some other people, but I usually work on 400 year old <laughs> work. I do Shakespeare or, you know, contemporary classics that are 50 years old and you try and make them unique. You try and keep, you know, you try and, you try and honor the, the history of it, but you try and make it unique as well. But with, with Lisa's work, it's just as complex as Shakespeare. It's just as intriguing and dynamic, but she can generate it. Her mind is literally Lamborghini. It's, able to generate so many things. And I, I, I joke with her that usually when I'm playing a character, I try to be at least within 15 to 20 IQ points of that character. But I'm just, you know, I'm always trying to my, lift myself up to, to, to the level of the character that she's written for me because she's written a character that's sharp and, and funny. Even if it's a small guy like Seymour and Monroe, he's got five little lines, but you know, you know who he is the moment he steps out on stage and it's just fun. That's what it means to me. Absolutely. Um, Lisa, how's your audio doing? Are you... um, everything's back. I actually am um, so happy to see all these amazing, talented, caring, and um, most important thing to me, um, uh, true people um, that I've worked with. Um, um, I've learned in my years on the earth, on this earth, that being right is not as important as being true. Um, and these are some really beautiful souls I've got a chance to make theater with in Austin, which has opened its arms up and embraced me. And what's exciting to me about having this play collection is I want, it to, you know, the subtitle this, you know, that's not here is of the Austin uh, era. Um, of, of work. And um, I realized, you know, in the Zoom era, I'm realizing that the, the all white cover though makes it hard for people to see <laughs> um, when you show it to them. But uh, Underground, Monroe, and the Mama Laws Three Plays is also about um, community. So, so having this Zoom kind of send off um, from Austin Playhouse, thank you so much, Laura, for hosting this, um, is um, having community that believes in your work. So a dear friend of mine who's been my interlocutor since the, um, the years of single black female, when I was a graduate student at Stanford, 
um, he's the one who said to me, you should put together all your plays and, and send it up as a collection. I'm like, are you crazy? Who's gonna wanna do those? The, you know, these plays have not been done in New York, right? Um, and um, believe it or not, there was actually a fight between uh, <laughs> publishers about who was gonna get this collection. So um, here I was thinking that, you know, who's gonna want this and ends up being, you know, a, a, a battle um, and Northwestern University Press and landed with them, although Duke was really, really wonderful about it um, be, um, and, had, and very imaginative um, about it. I wanted to be a place where uh, all these theater makers had their plays published and, and I, I'd be kind of a one-off at Duke. And I raised that because I love the way Duke's imagination is about embracing me as a scholar and artist because I, I hear from all of you that that's been an important part of our work together. and. Um, uh, Rudy talks about the Easter eggs that are, you know, in <laughs> in my work, um, and using whether it's numbers or names or uh, locations to kind of sing signal something bigger that hope people to, they will go ahead and um, dig deeper. But I'm just truly um, joyful. Um, of course, uh, I don't know the idea that it coming if it being published during the pandemic made me feel like okay, my first book actually, um, Beyond the Black Lady. Um, sexual and the new African American middle class came out in 2009 when the whole world was on fire financially as well. So I'm like, oh, I, mean, I keep winning. So people are now asking me ahead of time, when's your next book going to be published? Because I want to make sure I leave the planet. Uh, <laughs> because cause all hell is going to break loose. Um, and so it's just you know, kind of wild. But at the same time, it's also allowed people to kind of sit back and actually realize the other ways in which we can experience theater outside of the physical buildings. And I was happy to have um, the new play dinner being read uh, at the Road Theaters Festival on, you know, that was online and having people from all over the country. Um, you know, we all have those friends, man, I couldn't make it to, where's too much money? Or I wish it was in my town. It's like, it's coming to you in your living room for free. Uh, <laughs> and you still couldn't make it. So uh, <laughs> love you guys, but I see your slip showing. Um, but uh, but <laughs> honestly, I'm um, also really grateful to all, each of you for um, taking the time out and putting your hearts into the work. Um, it's, I, I tell people all the time, I say, I, I, have, I mentor people that become my mentors. So Rudy is, is, is that. Um, without Rudy, I would not have been on the stages of Austin. I, uh, I don't believe I would, you know, and definitely hadn't made the cover of the <laughs> Chronicle um, crazy um, to have. Um, so I, I and I, I, I'm paying it forward in that same way that my mentors are my friends and people that are, you know, we work to, and I, you know, tell them about things and it, 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 that's what it should be about. There's no teacher student, it becomes um, community. And I'm really blessed to have that. And, to, and, and I, um, for me, people, like, part of the reason I, I've said for years that I stayed in academia because I wanted to um, not be a starving artist because I like health insurance and food. Um, so, um, <laughs> and, I, um, and I love Christine because she is another uh, uh, professional uh, working mom um, and does this on the side. Um, but I really realize that for probably for both of us, the work we do informs, uh, the work we do outside of theater informs our, um, the work we do in theater. So, and I know now no longer say that I am a scholar, artist, teacher, um, and they all work in together. And I really want to, my, my new um, thing I really want to do is make sure that I make the work of people like us more visible as a thing and now no longer this kind of you know strange thing that they're and we support each other and know who we identify each other. So look for that coming up. Um, something that I'm, I'm I'm working on. But I just so happy to see all these faces um, in my Zoom um, chat and um, Phil. Uh, like I would like to have a big enough tent that we can all work together. Um, when uh, Christine and I take over Hollywood, we will have our. <laughs> we will, have you with our, our first look deals? Um, we, we, you know, but it really, it does make me think about what does it mean to be under resourced and have all these ideas? And it brings me to the great essay by Alice Walker um, in Search for Mother's Gardens and thinking about what was it like for uh, well, a, a, a person who was enslaved to be an artist and an artist's heart. And you see some of the, the horrific weapons of torture for um, enslaved Black people 
that were crafted by others who that was their 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 blessing their ministry was making um work out of steel it ended up being things that ended up also being instruments of destruction but they're like they're beautiful it's and it's kind of interesting to think about that you know what it means to to um not have access to and for us we have the access but it's still limited and looking at people who and some let's be honest or less talented than people i'm looking at right now that have access to all kinds of resources um both in terms of um the physical resources right you know they're they're right now they're hunkered down in their third home looking at the beach and writing and you know it's really tough because my dog misses the other dogs in the park where we live in our other house off of you know park avenue um <laughs> but i um so that's one part but also just being able to say i want to make this film and so distance wise and let's go ahead and do this and it sounds great we'll get our friends together and you know throw this thing together um and what could the world be if um, all artists got the support that they're getting in the UK right now for the arts um, from their government. So I just wanted to kind of always get I'm always going to disturb the peace, but I do want to, uh, I, I wish for all everybody I'm looking at right now, um, the resources, both physical, uh, health wise, safety wise, and uh, financial to be able to make the work that I know that you're, you're, you, all of you will make that will change the world we're living in because it needs to change. Um, and I'm hoping to see a better one in the time that, um, while I'm still here. I, it, that's, thank you, Lisa. <laughs> uh, thank you. No, and it's good. I meant to, to point out for, uh, anyone who may be listening to this podcast 15, 20 years from now, um, mm -hmm. as I'm sure it'll still be, you know, archived in libraries everywhere, uh, that this is being recorded in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and while this country in particular, is confronting its racist past and present and hoping to work for a better future, but it is a terrifying time in many ways. Um, and so I, speaking for myself, finding those things in this world that can uh, bring me joy and I feel share joy to others like a Lisa B. Thompson play collection coming out, I, I'm gonna embrace and run toward that as fast as I, I can. Um, because because those moments right at this particular moment in time feel a little few and far between. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you for continuing to lift our pandemics and financial crises and whatever else is going on with the world with your your books, Lisa. And I hope the next time the world falls apart, you're you're right there to publish something for us. <laughs> um, time to read. Well, <laughs> while uh, while we still have a, a few minutes here, um, I'd love to just kind of real briefly, if we can, if relatively briefly, um, run through some of the different development processes for for these three plays because they each had different journeys to um, to land on the Austin stage. And I I keep mentioning that they all they had their world premieres in Austin. I think um, for me, I've been in, in, in this town about 30 years, and I think a couple decades ago, Austin was really known for new works and producing new works. And it's, in my opinion, isn't as much. And I think um, some of that financial crisis about a decade ago um, made not all theater companies, but some of them a little more conservative in what they were willing to, to put out and invest in. And there's some, um, the venue crisis that Austin's facing, it, I think is tied in to its production crisis. There are fewer places that can just support mm -hmm. this work. I think that the, the Austin ecosystem is of course, like all ecosystems, all connected. Um, and I can't remember, and someone is very welcome to correct me, another um, three play collection like this that was published of, of world premieres from the Austin stages. Um, so I thought, I thought that was absolutely something worth celebrating and acknowledging here. So Underground was the first play to premiere in Austin, but it, it, um, it seems to be the most recently developed. Is that correct? No, I, um, actually, the, the order of development is um, Monroe, which I mm -hmm. first wrote uh, as a graduate student and um, revised uh, after, but in, in, in the, the only playwriting class I've ever taken, which was with Sri Moraga at Stanford. Uh, Sri Moraga, maybe people know of her being the co-author of This Bridge Called My Back with, with Gloria Anzadua. Uh, she's at Santa Barbara now, you see Santa Barbara. Um, and then um, 
I started working on underground. I was living in upstate New York in Albany. Uh, I was a professor at State University of New York in Albany's um, English department. And thinking about, I was out with some friends and saw this advertising for, I was looking for a place to buy and saw the advertising for a townhouse that had a beautiful exposed brick, hardwood floors, lots of light, was a stock on underground railroad next to, and I'm like, what, uh, uh? Being a Californian, that was striking to me. So I went, then, uh, thought, what would it mean to own a piece of Underground Railroad? And from there, that uh, un unfolded. Also, it was a way for me to reflect on living through the uprisings in Los Angeles in 1992. Um, so it took me, you know, years kind of thinking through that. So that that sense of the, that play of like something's happening you can't control that's out of control. Um, and then uh, the monologues was written began when I had my son. 14 years ago, and when um, I was uh, did the first time it, it had uh, a reading, I did it on my own and read it, all of the pieces to it um, when I was at, on a fellowship at the Du Bois Institute at Harvard, Skip Gates's beautiful palace for black thought and art. Um, uh, I, I'll, Skip is a, very special to me for that. He looked at me when I arrived and said, you don't have to do anything while you're here, but take care of your son. So I'll never forget him for that. Um, and I said, I'm like, no, I'm gonna use this place up. It's gonna be dust when I leave. Oh, um, so, um, and they did, a, uh, actually they, they brought in Coleman Domingo and several Broadway actors to do the first reading um, of the monologues. So them getting up on stage, um, it was underground, they got a chance, the first chance. And then um, I, at a whim, because back to that friend of mine that has uh, been around forever, he wrote me, I, I, I talked to him about my work, you know, what I'm going to do. And he said, send out Monroe, girl. That's the best one. That's, I love Cherry. And that's, that's my favorite. And I said, okay. And I went, I sent it out. And I <laughs> got this thing. You made the, you want, and I, and I was going to go out of town. I, I told her, I said, well, I'm going to go for this conference. And I'd be like, that's stupid. Kind of the conference. <laughs> Stay here and work on this piece. And that was a, a huge, so it was, it was about, it was also a moment of me deciding between the academia and um, the arts and realizing and um, pissing off the conference organizers and saying, sorry, I'm not going to go. Um, but it, it was a big turning point in my own head. So in developing um, that was an amazing process working with um, having that reading and the wonderful moment I had, I was waiting for the reading to start. And I saw this really handsome gentleman on the, on the aisle and, I, it, it was, and he was the only one sitting there. And I, and I said to him, gosh, I'm getting a hot flash. I'm really hot. <laughs> I said, I mean, I'm just nervous about the show. And he looked at me and said, Oh, you'll be fine. And I thought, what a sweet young, young sweet man. And after it was over, um, Laurel had me come up to give a talk back. And I'm walking up there and he grabs my hand and says, tell her I want it for the next season. And I was like, oh, this guy may be a little bit crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so I go get up on the stage and I didn't know that. So, so she asked us, oh, no questions, but I'll let him speak because he's a producing artist, a director. And it was Don Toner. And that's the rest of his history. So I was, I was like, I was like, the same guy. He's very dashing, and I'm a flirtatious, but her mom's safe. <laughs> but it was like a wonderful moment to think, and that's kind of like what happened with um, Seems Like Female. And, you know, that moment that the first reading that I have had, someone came to me and said, I want, I want it for the next season. So that's a wonderful thing, but it's also been very hard to get work done. So I'm realizing now when it clicks, like with Christine, it's like when it clicks, she saw the reading of um, Mama Logs at the Warfield Center's reading, and that weekend that I'm going to do it um, versus um, people like, well, I don't know, like, can you do a real reading for me? And do it? So now I'm learning now, go where the light is. It's like with Zoom, you want the light to hit you right. <laughs> so go with the light. People want you. They, it shouldn't be that hard. It's like, it's like, you know, dating too. It shouldn't be difficult. It should be um, love at first sight kind of thing. Um, healthy love. <laughs> Oh, I'll, I'll be out. Yes, I'll, 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 I'll keep it G-rated. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, that's the development process for each of these and being able to do it in Austin has been wonderful. And I am not, it's not lost to me that no black woman has had this uh, career in Austin. And I wanted to make note of that too. And I'm grateful for that. Well, and I think it's noteworthy, you know, I mean, Laura, you talk about that, that conservatism on the part of theaters and, um, you know, this, this idea that in order for a theater to survive, it has to produce, you know, the, the, the stalwarts, the classics, it has to do a certain amount of Shakespeare, a certain amount of, of you know, mid-century musicals and things like that. And, 
you know, I tell everyone that the run of Underground sold out completely, you know, and it was the only, there, there's only one other Vortex show that I've worked on that had that amount of selling out. And that one was like, I think literally nine times as large of a cast and a play like that was, that was for children as well as adults. And like, you know, we all know that kids shows tend to sell a lot better. You know, and so I think that the the idea that, oh, well, we can't produce new work, which, of course, also means the work by, you know, writers of color, you know, is, is such an excuse and it's such a bad excuse and it's such a, a, a useless one, because I think that, you know, Lisa's work in Austin has shown us that there is a very real hunger on the part of the black community in Austin and and the entire community of Austin, you know, for this kind of work. And I've been uh, so thrilled to see um, Lisa's work embraced by uh, people who have never come to the Vortex before, you know, and then also uh, theater artists, you know, who make very different kinds of theater from the kind we make at the Vortex coming in and saying this play is amazing and we love it and, and we love Lisa, you know, seeing like Austin theater artists, you know, buying the collection and being so excited on Facebook to show that they have it, you know, has been so heartening. And I, I fully agree, Rudy. I think I, uh, Austin Playhouse would probably by any metric be termed a more traditional theater in general. Um, and so I, I understand the, the impulse to kind of, you know, bring it in, go to the familiar with programming. Um, I fully and completely reject that as the best course of action in any time. Um, I think you need to go go where the work is and um, work that's exciting and compelling will bring in the audiences, absolutely. Um, so I wanna, uh, Mark, and Mark had to step away if anybody's wondering why, why he's grown strangely silent. Um, <laughs> he, uh, he, and so Valenicia, you worked on, on um, the monologues, but also recently on a single black female, mm -hmm. um, a play of Lisa's that isn't in this con collection, mm -hmm. the, uh, the 2019 production. And of course we're, we're sadly having to skip a 2020 Austin premiere of your work because of the pandemic, but, um, I also want to want to mention that um, Ground Floor Theater produced Single Black Female um, by Tashi. Thank you for being here. <laughs> um, and and they are also committed, I think, to to a production of Dinner. There's a new play that you're, that's in development that just had a reading. Um, so it's not just the Vortex and Austin Playhouse. There are there and Color of Art. There. Um, your work is being embraced by a wide range of Austin theater companies. And that also is a little unique to me because I think sometimes there's this playwright gets done at this theater, um, but you don't see them kind of everywhere. Everyone wants the next Lisa B. Thompson play. I'm going to speak for myself and say everyone <laughs> wants that. Um, so what 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 I know we've we've talked a little bit about what makes her work special. I think Marcus, you I would love to hear hear you and then Valenicia also, who's have kind of worked on several of her pieces. Um, speak to that. Why why does she she cross these barriers between theater companies that may have different focuses or different audiences? Uh, I mean, simple answer is she's good. <laughs> she's really good. Um, it's. It's, it's been really interesting to see how successful Lisa's been in Austin, which we know has a dwindling African-American population. I won't say dwindling. A smaller African-American population than, than when I first moved here, certainly. Uh, and yet her, her, her work strikes, strikes a chord. While it's, 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 very, it's, very, it's very Black, it's very culturally specific, but it resonates across, I mean, I, I sat there in the audience for Monroe and look across and there was black and Latino people and Asian people, you know, crying and laughing and it's like, why? How is that, how is that possible? And I, I think it goes to what's been said before. These, these characters are so vivid. They're so real. They're so lifelike. You forget you're, 
you're in the theater. Um, and, you know, quality trumps everything. You know, um, when you have, and again, when you have a solid director, when you've got a really good cast, um, uh, scripts that Lisa produces just come to life. It's, it's, it's musical. Um, it's, it's just a joy to listen to. It's very rare that as a Black actress, not just in this town, but even from my New York experience, gets to actually portray a Black, a black person of my actual age group like 30s to 40s. That isn't, you know, uh, a trope. And the idea that I got to do these very well-rounded women and it was a voice that catered to those women was also a, a blessing and just, it, it doesn't get, it doesn't really happen. So the fact that it got to happen in my actual hometown of Austin, because I'm born and raised in Austin, um, and even though we have a dwindling population within the center of Austin, the thing that I found fascinating is we still have, you know, Pflugerville, Round Rock, Hutto. These are all big, uh, big meccas at this point of people that are coming in and moving in. They're moving directly to those communities because they're like, oh, there are more people like me. For, um, for monologues, for single Black females, I know I'm a very big person who's like, post, 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 and all these different groups on Facebook. We had people coming in from these communities to see the art. So, you know, on a different note, the people are there. I just think Austin is finally waking up and realizing that there's a different audience than who we tend to cater to. And I think that voice and that realization was very important. And that's why so many people are seeing these amazing works by Lisa and wanting to be a part of it because it's not just good art, it's there's so many more communities that we could cater to that we don't. So thank you for taking that chance first and foremost. And I know that that's, in, that's important, um, but you know, off of that little soapbox for a moment, but um, yeah, it, it was being able to be in pieces that so well reflected my experience. Um, and then even the experience I hope to have, like I don't have children yet, but just reading the text, I was like, yeah, that's my mom. That's me and Bonnie. Yep, yep, that sounds like sugar. Like, I mean, these are women in my family that I was able to read and like immediately uh, feel, feel something for. So it was wonderful that you're able to show those experiences to a new audience. And I had a lot of other people, you know, similar to what Marcus was saying coming in who, you know, are like, oh, I'm not African-American, but I absolutely had that conversation with my child. I had this conversation every morning. It's just so, um, What's the word I want to look for? It's, it's so universal. A lot of those conversations that we don't realize, and Marcus is right, it's a very Black voice, but when you realize that, that Black voice is also a universal voice, I think that's one of the things that um, Lisa is wonderful about communicating, um, and it makes people realize that we're all people. Uh, so I, I think that it's important that our work is being done right now because it's, it's about bringing people together to a large degree. And, and I also have to say thank you for that because it's, it's, it's hard to be a writer who can, who can just so beautifully illustrate and create these storylines that everyone understands, but anyone can also watch and specifically understand culturally what, what she's saying. But I don't know if that all made sense. I have a lot of coffee in my body right now, but. That was great. I, I wanted to chime in just a bit about the um, faces in the Zoom. Um, look like the faces in my, um, kindergarten through 12th grade um, class pictures and yearbooks. Um, and I would love to have um, the work that I'm doing next reflect that. Um, you know, I grew up with um, you know, my best friend being Native, half Native, half Native, African American, good friends who were Filipina, who were uh, Latino, uh, Puerto Rican, uh, from, from Libya. Um, and that's was growing up in the Bay Area in the 70s. It was like right, working class neighborhoods with all, you know, everybody and eating everybody's food and learning how to do, you know, learning about all those cultures because it was part of um, hanging at your friend's house. It wasn't a special day on the Filipinos. It was just like, I'm over at Danny Gallag's house and we're going to, you know, his mom's making pancit. Yes, you know, <laughs> you know? or, um, um, you know, hanging out with my friend Priscilla Alvarez, whose family was from Salvador, and you know, we, you know, having tamales and you know, just the things. So I, would, I, I feel like the work, in some ways, has been um, I'm working from my own viewpoint, but it's not. I'm not being 
as generous as I could be about that viewpoint because my world is uh, queer and straight and bi and, and non-binary and uh, friends who've always embraced this. And I realized, so I started working more to push a little bit more on that for my work. So this is the, the stuff coming later will reflect more of that uh, complex world that a lot of people, particularly African Americans sometimes don't want to see. Because like, you know, you're, now you're, you're watering it down. It's like, well, that's just what the world I have. And clearly from this Zoom is like, that's my world. You know, people in my family are white, Asian, um, Latino, it's like, it's like, that's my family. So what are we going to do with that? Um, and, and I want the work to reflect that. Um, majority of them are African American, but some of them are from California, some of them from the South, some of them from the East Coast, and I uh, want to reflect that too. So I, I feel like I have a lot I want to bring to the world. Good. We need you to bring all of it. <laughs> so this is, so I had, um, and I believe part of what I also wanted to, you know, bring this group together, a there were a lot of intersections, as we saw, of people who'd worked together, worked with Lisa in different capacities, from play readings to full productions. Um, Deja, this was her first time working on a Lisa B. Thompson play, but I'd worked with her before. Um, on a, a, She'd worked with my theater company before on um, a production of Satchel Paige. And so when we needed to find a, a new cherry for the world premiere production, um, I wanted someone that I knew and trusted and believed in her ability to really bring this, um, this character to life. Um, and it was a character that I hadn't seen as a central um, protagonist in any play. Um, and so what was it, what was that process like for you? I know it was stressful as all get out a lot of the time, um, but you did it. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, I just, uh, I, my Pisces nostalgicness is like, I've just been feeling so grateful just listening to everyone and I miss Austin so much and just like all of the wonderful like experiences that I've had working with like other black artists in Austin and like the opportunities that I've had at Austin Playhouse. So I'm just like, just going back down memory lane. But um, yeah, it was, it was, I'm not gonna lie, like at first it was very intimidating because I had never ta taken like a, on a role um, like that before. And our big way for me to like get to know like Lisa in a meaningful way. And, so, and I felt like, like, I don't know how many like people or like actors get to work with like the playwright, like in the show, like, and it was just really great to have like Lisa right there. And I felt like I was taken under her wing and that felt really comforting and like really assuring in terms of like really getting to connect with Cherry and just like listening to like how like her thoughts about like building this character and like just Lisa's feelings towards Cherry and it was just really nice to like have that perspective and have like a personal connection with Lisa B. Thompson because like I don't think that that's something that you get to do with every project that you work on and I felt like you know Lisa was rooting for me and that was like a huge thing to me because I admired her before she even knew who I was and I was just like really grateful to like be in that space. Oh the fact that she worked with me on in the show she really I, I pulled this up she really worked with me on the show because I had I did it. Well that's that's what I wanted to, I wanted to end with you. So you you had to take the stage on Monroe. Um yes. <laughs> on this one we had a closing weekend we um Taji was able to to come in and step in for a couple a couple of our final performances but she couldn't be there very at the very closing weekend um so so the final performances of Monroe Dr. Lisa B Thompson had to play cousin Viola um and jump in there and it was and you did you did a brilliant job um it is it is captured on on film our archive copy of the show has has that performance um so, she wasn't even off book can you believe it? She was. <laughs> I will say next next time you write a play, you have to memorize the whole thing just in case. Um, <laughs> What's the line? Oh, it was fun. No. So Christine, I I I've always I mean you can speak to whatever you want, but I you have a a film background as well. Um, congratulations on share with everyone the the what what did you, what did you just win? Tell us all again. 
I was selected for the Writers Lab, the 2020 class, which is um, it's a um, sponsored by Meryl Streep, Nicole Kidman, Oprah Winfrey, uh, the New York um, um, Women in Film and Television, uh, Writers Guild of America East, Tribeca, all these wonderful supporters of women screenwriters over 40. And I don't have the largest film background because um, this, is, this is my first screenplay. Uh, but the fact that they are supporting women over 40 and giving us an opportunity to tell our stories gives um, some kind of balanced playing field. And I remember sharing with Lisa, um, we are living in a world that celebrates things like uh, Austin's top 30 over 30, or you know the stars um, under 30 or under 40. What about the people who are over 40, who are over 50? Does that mean that we can't have a second act that we can't have a chance to have our own coming of age story, maybe after our kids are a little bit older. Uh, that's where a lot of us reside when we try to find our artistic voice that we may not have had the access or resources to tap into because life told us you need to make a living and be self-sufficient. Being an artist is not gonna get you there. And so we don't have the, the luxury or privilege to find that until we have um, been able to stand on our own two feet without parental assistance, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's where Lisa and I really connected. Um, some people say, if you want something done, give it to a person who's busy because we know how to multitask. We know how to organize. Right now I'm getting text messages from work because they want me to work this weekend. It's driving me insane. Um, and so, uh, and I'm trying to balance all these things while at the same time I have barbecue chicken drumsticks marinating in the refrigerator. So I can just pop it in the oven and keep on working. Um, my face is getting hot just thinking about all the things I gotta do today, it's crazy. But Lisa is laughing, I see her beautiful face on Zoom because she knows exactly what I'm talking about. I see Marcus too, because he's a working parent and you know, you're trying to make this artist life work while also having a job and getting health insurance for the family. You know, none of us are trust fund babies who had the ability to uh, go to film school because you can live your dreams. How wonderful would that have been? But that wouldn't be our story and we wouldn't have the richness that we have now to tell the stories that tap into so many people. That's what Lisa's work does, it's universal. It talks to everyone's struggle, everyone's pain, without shying from being a Black story and being proud of being like front and center in all the characters, in the spotlight. You know that this is a Lisa B. Thompson work because it's honest. And that's why people connect to it and that's why people are fighting over it. So buy this book, produce her work, and sell out some of these shows. And credit Austin, Texas, because Austin, Texas is where these plays got birthed, uh, got their world premieres. So remember, there are stories in the South. It's not just East Coast, it's not just West Coast. And make sure that these stories in the South are told by Southerners, because people get it wrong when they try to tell Southern stories. The American South has talent, the American South has artists. Uh, that's representation that we need to, to make sure is honest as well. And so, and Lisa gets that. By the book. Thanks, Christine. Um, as, as someone else over 40 and still really looking forward to a lot of new artistic pursuits, I um, it's always awesome to celebrate other other women that are that are getting theirs. So I'm I'm so happy for you. Congratulations. I I think it's I think it's um, very evident that you 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 create community wherever you go and um and artists are drawn to that. We're you know little little moths to your joyful flame and want to want to be near it, want to bask in it and want to do our best work to make you proud. And when Roe is a play, I would redirect in a heartbeat. I'm like, I know what I should have done there and that and we could do this and needed these projections in there. Um, so I, and I, I don't know that I'll get that chance, but I look forward to seeing other productions of it and, and seeing what other, other brilliant collaborators bring.
to the table with these yeah. all of these works. Um, I, I wish I wish them and every future endeavor of yours a long and successful and awesome life out in the world. So thank you all very much for being with us today. Um, it is always a pleasure to be in conversation with Dr. Lisa B. Thompson and celebrate any of her works. We have um, Monroe and Underground and the Momologues, and it is in print right now from uh, Northwestern University Press. And it's available from any bookseller. Um, it's on um, the, the Evil Empire, Amazon as well, Barnes and Noble, and any independent bookstore in Austin. Uh, Bookhouse, is that right? Book people, book people. Book people. Yay. I put the same place as bookhouses. In, 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 Austin Playhouse. If we had a bookstore, it would be Austin Bookhouse. Book <laughs> <laughs> people. Hey, in the lobby. Um, yes. We absolutely, uh, we, we, uh, we absolutely will. Um, all right. Thanks, y'all, very much. Have a great day. Thank you so great much, everyone. Day. Austin Playhouse. Thank you, Laura. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to Play On with Austin Playhouse. If you enjoyed this episode, you can hear more episodes on Spotify, SoundCloud, or visit our website at awesomeplayhouse.com. Awesome Playhouse's building campaign is in full swing. We are working to build the first ever publicly funded performing arts venue in Austin. If you would like to join our grassroots fundraiser, please check out our website at awesomeplayhouse.com and make a donation today. We thank you for supporting Austin artists. See you next week.